rather brief question. Okay. Um, the, in relation to Australia's commitment to the to the um, to the agreement, the Paris Agreement, the new. How do you feel about the new corporate head of the CSIRO, Larry Marshall, who has implemented major cuts to the CSIRO's climate modelling, measuring and research division, the loss of at least 50% of the staff in favour of a refocus towards the in partnership with business, the profitable adaptation to climate change accepted as an inevitability. The Australian Climate Council has condemned Larry Marshall's policies as a breach of Australia's obligations under the recent Paris Agreement. And Larry Marshall dismisses the Climate Council's criticisms and the criticisms of many other international scientists. He characterises their criticisms as more like a religion than science. Now, the actions of Larry Marshall's approach and his um, demolition of the CSRO and his, his viewing of research towards the profitable exploitation of the opportunities presented by the inevitability of climate change as he sees it, does that not vindicate Naomi Klein's view, quote, that the, of the disaster, and for criticism, of the disaster capitalists who seek to profit from global warming and the destruction of the environment? And following on from that, uh, it, this changes everything, that in order to avoid ca catastrophic global warming, we have to effect a fundamental change in the social economic order, overthrowing the rules of capitalist economics and the zombie ideology of neoliberalism. Your thoughts on that? Thank you. That's a very good question. Is that working? Yes. Um, I get the thrust of your, your question. And the thrust of your question is, is this. If we've got the head of the CSIRO, Signed on to a signed on to a program that's searching for the profit that you can make out of adapting to catastrophic climate change. Then we're going to go to hell in a handbasket. That's your question. Yes. Um, and your question really answers itself. Uh, Mr. Marshall is signing on to some strange new um, uh, capitalist venture that is seeing. In sea levels and destruction of urban infrastructure and displacements, there, there may well be some elements of, the, of a capitalist economy that seize upon the enormous disruptions and investments in new, in new, new infrastructure and seize upon it as a profit-making activity. And no doubt there are people in corporate boardrooms around the planet looking to see how they can make money from the destructive cataclysmic effects of, of global climate change. And I think, well, indeed, and it's, it's an amazing thing about the capitalist economy, isn't it? It can destroy a part of the planet and then try and make a profit out of dealing with the consequences of its destruction. Um, and I think we should be alive to that. That, you know, we see as citizens and, you know, and hopefully it's something more than just little consumers, but as citizens on this planet, we see these appalling effects, and, and we see the displacement of hundreds of millions of people, the destruction of urban infrastructure as, as terrible consequences um, that we need to do everything we can to avoid. But there are absolutely certainly um, a minority, and hopefully only a very small minority, but a minority of people sitting around corporate boardrooms who are looking for this as a profit-making venture. And that is, that is a frightening reality. Um, um, how do we how do we end that? Well, I think we need to get away from, as you point out, a, a commitment to neoliberalism, where all the key decisions about resource allocation happen in those boardrooms. We need to democratically seize, con return control of the planet and our economy. This last weekend, I was down in Berrima and Mitagong. And there are signs up everywhere on people's properties about the battle for Berrima. No coal, water, not coal. These sorts of signs up absolutely everywhere. Are you aware that there's new mines opening up down around Berrima and Mittagong? Um, yeah, indeed. And, and the prospect not just coming from the Southern Highlands, but also coming from the Illawarra, the prospect of undermining, uh, of mining under our drinking water catchment in Sydney and destroying the, 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 the source of our clean water is, is 
it, it's kind of mind-numbing and mind-boggling that our, our federal government has committed to Paris while our state government is approving expansions um, of existing coal mines and approving entirely new coal mines that are actually digging under Sydney's water catchment. Um, it is mind-numbing. And, you know, and of course on the Liverpool Plains, we've seen at the same time as Paris was being negotiated, we've seen the, um, the, both the Commonwealth and the state governments give appro approval to a massive new mine on the Liverpool Plains. You know, and the Liverpool Plains are kind of unique in terms of 100 metres thick of black soil in a little microclimate where it pretty much rains every year. And yet they're willing to destroy a part of it for yet another coal mine. Um, am I aware of it? Yes. Is there a growing community and a pretty resolute community there to say, to, to stand up against it? Yes, and you've witnessed some of that yourself. We just saw the community in Gloucester kick out coal sand gas and three cheers for that. Um, absolutely. This is an industry, coal and coal seam gas, that's lost its social licence. Lost its social licence. It's still got a political licence because it pays for that. Um, but it's lost its social licence. Um, it's a question of translating that loss of social licence to some new laws and some new politics that actually says no to their, to their approvals. Um, David, you mentioned that uh, with the other uh, recent uh, Paris talks that um, the uh, Turnbull uh, agreeing to the um, uh, coming to the party on that was uh, in part uh, uh, probably because of uh, knowing that uh, public opinion on the issue has uh, considerably uh, changed since uh, Abbott was uh, voted in about uh, three, four years ago and that there is more awareness of uh, uh, the need for action and so on and um, how uh, unfortunately, that sort of uh, the commitment to um, obligation to uh, to talk the uh, uh, to walk the talk uh, certainly doesn't seem to be evident. Uh, so my question is that uh, while there has been this increasing of uh, public awareness of the need to do something, uh, to what extent uh, is the public starting to see through um, uh, the? Uh, the the uh, Turnbull not really committing to uh, walking the talk, or uh, until now, uh, would Turnbull still have been pretty relatively successful in hoodwinking uh, the people that he is doing something? I know your question was directed to David, but I'll kick off and give it a pat around. Um, no, no, that's not true. <laughs> I, mean, I think just in terms of public awareness, I think what we've seen, and David was right when he spoke about Copenhagen and the kind of collapse of Copenhagen and then the kind of revitalisation of civil society after that. And you know, I think around the world, we've just seen so much action on climate change in the last few years. And these, the, the rally is going into Paris. Melbourne had the largest rally in the world. And, you know, there was, yeah. and Sydney was pretty good too. So, you know, I think that people really do know, and really, I think there is a gathering momentum and it's beyond the environment movement as it should be. If you're talking about climate justice, you need to be talking beyond the, the, the more traditional environment movement. They have a really important role to play but we need to be, you know, much more diverse and, and Naomi Klein talks about that as well in, in, in her work. So I definitely think that we're starting to see that happening globally around the world. And, you know, in, in terms of, um, you know, does this mean that, that Turnbull in particular is, is more aware of this? I think they are. I think the politics, though, will determine whether they actually, you know, end up taking this further as an election issue. And I think it's up to people to make sure that, that they do. Um, I want to make one other comment. I mean, I know we're in Australia, and I know we're talking about Australian politics and climate change in Australia. Really important. We're a really large per capita emitter. We have a role to play, um, definitely. But we also need to look at what's happening around the world as well. And you know, increasingly, you know, we are seeing, for, for driven by a range of complex triggers and reasons, we are seeing other countries from those most impacted by climate change, through to even countries, you know, through countries like China, really looking at what they need to do. You know, China a lot because of pollution and energy security and things like this. But I think what we're going to see is in the medium term, the high cost of humanitarian disasters coupled with decreasing prices of renewable energy, I think that will force 
action on climate change. Now, maybe I'm being a bit glass half full on that. I can certainly be glass half empty on, on other issues, but I do believe that you know, we are seeing, I, I think that will shape the, the medium term. But of course the issue is we have to be acting now, not in the medium term. So, oh, but I'll pass over. Um, well, I'd agree with everything that Kelly's put, but in terms of the politics of it, and can Malcolm Turnbull sell his politics and try and and try and convince the Australian people that that's, that he's doing something, that something's happening, and therefore take climate change off 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 the political agenda? Because that's really what he wants. He doesn't want it on the political agenda. And ideally, you you say something or do something, and you take it off as an issue, and you carry on as business as usual. And I think. Um, with our current policy uh, parameters, there, there are, there's, there's a number of different um, analyses of where we're headed with our current policy parameters, and I'm not talking about our targets, but actually what we do. And with state and federal policies set where they are, I think we're projected to have something like a 61% increase on carbon emissions, not a 28% reduction um, on 2000 levels. So that's what our policy settings are, are directing us to. and. You know, I think one of the one of the, as I said in my earlier contribution, one of the cleverest things that governments have done in responding to the emerging reality of climate change, at least in their eyes, um, is they've kept moving the base. And originally, you know, 1990 was what we were talking about uh, with the Kyoto Protocol. 1990 as the base, and and. Of course, then we went to 2000, and we're currently operating on a 2000 base, you know, the 5% reduction by 2020 of our 2000 base. And now we've moved to a 2005 base, this 28% reduction on a 2005 base. Um, now, there have been a number of different analyses about what that actually means if we converted it back to 1990. Kelly might correct me if I'm wrong here, but I think the range is what that 28% reduction actually means something between 5% below and 5% above 1990 levels, which if every developed country in the world committed to, would see global temperatures in the range of 3 to 4% growth by the end of the century. So we, are, we, are, we aren't we are even pretending to pull our weight, but cleverly, by making 2005 as the base target, a 28% reduction sounds really meaningful, sounds kind of better than what we were talking about in a, you know, a 5% reduction, and it sounds better than what we were talking about even in, in, in the late 1990s. And he's trying to sell this 28% reduction. And, and you know, even this discussion, as I've tried to communicate it to you, shows how complicated it is when you start talking about the numbers. As soon as it gets complicated, they win. Simple as that. As soon as it gets complicated, they win. So they put something complicated up and they pretend it's good. And, and it's it, the task, I think, of politicians and climate change campaigners is to make it simple. And it's simple. This is not good enough. If we continue down this path, our kids won't have a safe planet to live on. Um, uh, and we need to, to make radical changes to our energy. No new coal, no new coal mines, and we need to be getting to 100% renewable energy. But let's talk about the real things, not the pretend targets of Turnbull. Um, yeah. Which turns it up? The bottom, the bottom, the bottom. The bottom. Um, yes, thanks uh, Kelly and David. Um, I think your summary of, of what Paris was and what came out of it is, is extremely accurate. Um, the, the question I have is all the, all the issues that, that David mentioned that, um, and, the, and that Kelly mentioned leads us to a huge dilemma. Uh, to me, I can't see how we can solve this problem of climate change without removing power from the multinational corporations that run the world. There's no, all, all the figures that you've mentioned, all the problems and the spin and all that sort of thing, all boils down to the fact that we have a, a world run by fossil fuel corporations and their agents. So all these governments are putting out figures and changing the baseline and all this sort of thing we, we, we've got a much bigger problem, I think, and it's a social. It's, that's where the question of the social justice issue and the climate issue come together. If we don't fundamentally change the power structure in the world, we cannot solve this problem because they will keep changing the spin and and just 
you know, just changing the, uh, the baseline until we reach this critical point. And that's where the, the, the island nations are, are sort of starting to raise, it, raise the issue to us. We, we, this is really the greatest challenge that humanity has ever faced. And, the only, and I, I won't speak too long, but I just want to mention that when people have talked about what we need to do, they've talked about World War II and the, you know, a war economy and all this sort of thing, making an analogy. To me, we're going to have to have a massive change in all our structures and a, a, a huge democratic revolution. We're basically going to have to have a people's power revolution if we're going to solve this problem because we cannot just solve it by business as usual. Business as usual means the fossil fuel companies will have their way one way or another. So I think this is the real question. Myself, I stand for a socialist alternative. I can't see any other alternative. I think we've got to replace capitalism. But we can use different terminology. It's an absolute critical question to change the entire structure of power in the world if we're going to solve this problem. I can't see any lesser way of doing it. Thank you. Say that. Yeah. I, mean, I, mean, I don't know we need to say a lot to that, um, just to say that, you know, definitely agree and that's also one of the, you know, premises of the book Naomi Klein wrote, which is this change is everything. Um, so, yeah, I think that's that's probably um, what, what, what I would say. I guess, you know, we, we've seen, what I, what I would say, actually, just to add, is that we have seen a lot of creative campaigning in Australia, particularly by young people, AYCC for example, the Australian Youth Climate Coalition, who have really started to go over, go after the vested interests of fossil fuels. And, you know, it, it might be that you don't achieve as, as rapidly as we need the changes, but as soon as you attack the bottom line of corporates, you start to get some traction. So as soon as you start to expose that they're funding coal mines, that they're funding Adani, um, as soon as you start to call that out publicly through their shareholder meetings, and this is what some of AYCC have done last year, you know, and I think we, so I think we have started to see some really creative campaigning around starting to, to really hit corporates where it hurts and that's at the bottom line. But of course you're right. That's, that's only part of the issue, and that you know we do need a, a fundamental transformation of, of society and the economy. Reasserting democratic control of our resources and our land and our economy is is, is essential. It, it reminds me. Your question reminds me of a, a wonderful. I think it was Kathy Wilcox cartoon um, from about a decade ago when there were still you know climate change deniers running around, and she had this image of. Um, um, of windmills and solar panels and public transport and like a community, uh, a, a sort of small scale community uh, living, living amongst trees and in obviously a, a kind of um, more collective method. And, and it looked good, you know, there was this, this um, and there was a climate, there was, there was a fossil fuel executive on the other side. And he was saying, what if we do all of this? And it turns out that, that, that it was all for no purpose and climate change wasn't real. Um, and, and, and I think when we, we saw the initial opposition from the likes of Howard, and we see it now in the sort of circus that goes for the Republican nominees in the United States, you can see them deeply frightened of what actually addressing climate change means. Because it actually does mean taking power from corporate America and corporate Australia. It actually does mean a handing control of resources and the economy to communities and re-empowering democratic governments to actually create a mixed economy where, where we actually accept the political reality of resource allocation happening um, through democratic means for social and environmental good rather than all of our resource allocations happening in corporate boardrooms solely for profit. That is a big part of dealing with climate change. That's the reality of it, and that's really why there's been this vicious, vicious right-wing campaign against it. You know, because what if we democratise capital? What if we reassert control over resource allocation? What if we build amazing public transport? What if we re-green our cities? And what if we do all of that um, in order to tackle climate change? 
and then we accidentally democratise the economy at the same time. Heaven, um, heaven forbid. It's, yeah, heaven forbid. They're <laughs> deeply frightened of it. I think connected to um, the questions that have already been asked is my question. Um, the Greens, to me, seem to have the only credible policy across the full policy spectrum, whether it's on climate change, the economy, the full range of issues, labour relations. Um, yet, I don't think the leadership of the Greens see themselves as a, as a party of government and their ambitions don't seem to look towards being a party of government. I think you've got the ability to be there, but you may not have the ambitions to be there. Am I right in that? view and what will it take until the Greens are seen as a credible alternative party of government? Well we would hope that the people who observe what we do would see us as a credible alternative for government and, and I, look, I look at my colleagues and none of us are perfect but then I compare myself and my colleagues to the other mob that I share the parliament with and I think we probably do a pretty darn sight better job which is insane a lot. I mean, it's a pretty low bar to do better than the current governments at a state and federal level. So I think we would be a credible and a, and a significant improvement. But you're quite right in saying, you know, within the current economy and the current political structures, there are people within the Greens who say, well, if we, if we actually seize control with the current leaders to hand, would it actually turn us into one of them? Would we end up making all of those compromises although with a nice green tinge on it, and would we, with those existing levers being the only thing we can control the economy and society with, would we just become a slightly greener, maybe slightly socially more responsible version of Labor? And that, that is the kind of thing that, if you're a politician in a party committed to politics of principle, frightens you. And I'll be quite frank with you, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an anxious prospect. And so, for example, if the Greens um, achieve balance of power, sole balance of power in the Senate, and there's a coalition government, how much do you sit down and engage with the coalition and force your agenda upon them, and how much do you allow some of their agenda to be achieved? Um, because that's seen to be the responsible thing in the federal Senate. These are really hard questions for politicians committed to politics and principle. But I think we've got a pretty clear lesson of what happens when you abandon your principles with the Democrats. They disappeared overnight. So we've got to stick to our principles and we have to believe that if we get into government we'll be able to govern according to our principles. And that's why I think we, if we, if and when, and hopefully it's a question of when we do get into government, we need to acknowledge that the current levers that governments are using are grossly inadequate to deal with the challenge that we have to hand and we need to be actually facing those hard decisions of democratising capital of reasserting control over corporate boardrooms, of producing a genuinely mixed economy. And, you know, I look at our candidates like Kim, Casey and Grainler, um, and I think we've got candidates who are, in the current federal election, willing to face those challenges, have a sort of social and economic construct that allows them to face those changes. I look at what Richard, for example, at the moment, Richard Di Natale is doing federally on drugs, getting out there and challenging that existing paradigm and demanding evidence-based response on drugs. If we, if we said exactly the same thing nationally ten, at a state and national level 10 years ago, also at a state level, I think, 10 years ago, and we were mercilessly kicked, attacked in all of the tabloids. Well, I think actually we've got more credibility now because we're saying the same things now with every bit as much evidence backing and, and it's actually changing the national conversation on drugs. Um, so I think there's hope that we can actually achieve government maintain most of our principles, hopefully all of them, and, and be part of the solution. But we're not going to get there just by being nice or just by having the most evidence-based. It's actually, politics is a pretty grubby hard sport and there's going to be a lot of bruises and battles between now and then. I'm much involved in the Israel-Palestine dispute, so I'm a little bit overwhelmingly involved with BDS, but I'm wondering if the use of boycott is a good one, 
in that surely capitalists that realise coal is coming to an end could be persuaded not to lend money to continue opening coal mines. And I have been writing to banks suggesting as much and I have been having some success. What do you think about that? I'll grab that one first and then pass it over. I think it's a really good point and I think there's, I think what you're talking about is being called divestment um, in, in, the, um, in, in the, the climate space at the moment and it's exactly that. It's writing to banks as customers, as shareholders, as you know, our NGOs, as small businesses and saying we're not going to do, we're not going to do our banking with you if you continue to fund fossil fuels and fossil fuel expansion. And, and that is happening. Um, now, I think that's been, you know, I mean, you can say it might be happening quick enough, but certainly last year, this was a, one of the really big levers going into Paris globally and actually took off quite phenomenally was the whole divestment movement, not only here in Australia, um, but, but around the world. And there's been a lot of people involved in that. Well, one of the organisations that's been driving it, but by no means the only one, has been 350.org. But there's been many, many others involved in it. So I think that, yes, you're, you're absolutely right, um, that you know divestment um, of finance away from fossil fuels. And it's what I was talking about before, about hitting corporations, the, your big corporations, your fossil fuel companies, sort of where, where it hurts, which is the bottom line which you know, is not in itself enough for transformation because you have to have alternatives there as well, but certainly it aids that. So. Well, I, I, it's definitely about divestment. I mean, I took great pleasure going down with my co-signatory for the Wallara Greens um, just earlier this month and withdrawing our, all our money from the Commonwealth Bank and putting it into Bendigo. That's I don't think that shook the foundations of the Commonwealth Bank, <laughs> um, but it was a nice little <laughs> moment. They were nice to be able to do it, that's right. Um, and I think maybe uh, in terms of where we're getting to in terms of the political and the economic power of the divestment strategy, I think if you cast your mind back to 2014 and there was a push at the time to get ANZ to pull away from funding Adani and to, and, and to embarrass and force ANZ to pull out and, and re, rethink the way it, it funds coal and fossil fuel industries. And at the end of 2014, ANZ basically said, no, get stuffed, we're going to do what we like. It's about maximising profits to shareholders. You wind forward 12 months to the end of 2015, and, and I make this statement with a whole lot of accepting the corporate spin of ANZ, ANZ actually came out and launched an entirely new policy on an entirely new set of principles and policies on how or if it would lend to the coal and fossil fuel sector with a huge amount of, of improvements in terms of the, um, the social and environmental impacts that it would consider before it lent to coal. Now, obviously, what we should be demanding from ANZ is no funding at all and no lending, but within 12 months, they went from saying, no, we're not going to do anything because the divestment campaign was kicking up I think the National Australia Bank broke and said they'd never fund Adani. And we've seen the divestment having real impacts in the real economy. Now, now it's actually easier for banks in 2016 to say they won't lend to coal because I think their accountants and their bankers are saying, well, we better not lend to coal because we won't get the money back. Yes. And I think that's probably more the reality. They haven't had this huge awakening of social conscience. They now are able to say, well, we've got a policy where we don't lend to coal. And the truth is, they've got a policy they don't lend to coal because if they lend it to coal, they're probably not going to get it back because of the, 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 you know, the terminal global slide in the price of coal. And you know, maybe this is one of those occasions when the capitalist economy has had a small amount of self-correction in it. Even, even in their own terms, it's now become almost toxic to invest in fossil fuels. And if you've got any of your superannuation in it, you should insist on getting a full... Yeah. Can you please wait till he asks the questions? Hi, um, this is to both the panelists. Um, Dave, you mentioned that there's a failure in this, the federal government.
government policy to even project to meet our current target. And obviously that will get a lot harder with the future target. If, if this government stays in and the policy doesn't change, do you see that there will be more pressure on state and local governments to do more? And if so, what type of policies do you think you might see coming through? Well, this is where I, I wish John Kay was here. Uh, because John has been running at his, um, uh, around New South Wales 100% renewable campaign for New South Wales. And it's definitely viable and capable for New South Wales to become a 100% renewable energy state by 2030. Absolutely, no questions asked. Um, and indeed, the, the, the modelling from places like the University of Newcastle has shown that if we had a state government committed to that, we would actually have a significant jobs growth and economic growth. Um, so, yes, absolutely. With a, with a, if we continue to have a failure of leadership and a failure of effective policy at a federal level, there is an absolute obligation on state and local government to take those steps to turn it, turn us to 100% renewable. Because, you know, the, the state government's going through a process of trying to flog off all the coal-fired generators at the moment. No doubt they've talked to the bankers at ANZ and realised that they're going to have some stranded assets and they want to get a few billions out of it now while they can. The real concern is, of course, have those contracts for sale tied the state government into not taking adverse action against those generators. And I fear that is tied up in those contracts, um, which, which will then become an argument within Treasury to take no steps to go towards renewable energy. But not all the sales have happened. Many of the assets are still in public hands. Um, and even so, they're ageing and, and deteriorating assets, which will need to be renewed anyhow. So there is definite opportunities in fact, there's, there's, a, there's, there's almost a, an, there's an absolute obligation on state governments to move. Local councils as well, and indeed groups of regional co local councils in particular, in areas where there is enormous wind assets and there are solar assets, and lots of Western New South Wales have amazing wind and solar assets. If groups of local councils get together on a regional level, they have a real capacity to actually build renewable energy infrastructure in regional New South Wales and be a big part of the solution, not just for addressing climate change, but actually for keeping economic activity and jobs in regional New South Wales. And that's kind of happening. There have been, uh, pretty, pretty much every council west of the Sandstone Curtain has signed on to a commitment um, to be part of building renewable energy. That requires some seed funding for capital. Um, but there actually is a, a movement amongst regional councils in New South Wales, as I said, west of the Sandstone Curtain. And there's, there's a collective commitment to build renewable energy. To make that happen, though, we need some seed funding from the state and the federal government. And that's kind of exciting that we've got that in regional councils. I won't add much to that. I agree with um, that response. I think what I would add, though, is that in, to, to tackle climate change, which you know, is, we've heard people talking about it as you know, one of the biggest challenges we're facing, I think we we need action at all levels regardless of whether, like if the national government, our, our current government is not acting, then they should be and we should be forcing them to act, but that shouldn't preclude us from taking action on a local, on a state, at a community level. I mean, there's some amazing things in Australia going on with biomass for energy production in local community areas. And, you know, all, so, so I guess my view on this is that it's not, it's never if these people aren't doing that or the, if the government isn't doing this, should we do this? We really have to be using all the tools and all the levers at, at our you know, command or at our fingertips to, to actually um, you know, tackle, tackle climate change. So, you know, and I think we've seen some of the uh, resilient cities um, programs. I think you know, some of them have been quite, some haven't been so great, some have been quite remarkable in Australia. Um, so, yeah, I, I definitely think that the role of local community, local government, um, state government it, are, are really vital re regardless of what happens globally and what happens domestically. Yeah. Byron Council. Uh, Byron Shire Council is actually, um, of, all, of all Australia's councils, has actually committed to their own council-wide um, renewable energy, 100% renewable action plan 
um, which I haven't got time to, to sort of break down now, but I'd urge you to go away and have a look at what Byron Council is doing and try and demand your local council do the same as what Byron's doing. Last question, um, Joe Nagy. Uh, one thing you haven't mentioned, although you've inferred it, is the big picture, the global situation. You've just seen what happened with Iran and the rest of the world over nuclear uh, bombs. They stopped it. They put ban bans in these, uh, they, they took action to stop them from doing economic action. Why can't the governments of the world, or the government of the world, the UN, take the same action but those who are not taking action to decrease carbon and also rewarding those who are taking action to eliminate carbon. That's the first thing. The second thing is the economic argument you point out, David, uh, is that coal is declining. The, um, the, the other part of your question um, is, what well, well, was direct, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm... Uh, UN sanctions. Oh, UN sanctions. The, um, we don't have a U. We don't have a world government. We don't have a UN government. We have a, a strange sort of anarchic collection of, of 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 national governments who get together and occasionally agree about things, but make sure when they do agree about things, they don't put any sort of binding force or power to actually make that agreement happen. And then they say, okay, now we all agree. Now you could just go back and be good. And that's the way that's the way it operates. You know, the, if if we wanted to control the world's biggest emitters. We would, need, um, we would need the Pacific Islands and Sub-Saharan Africa to impose a military solution on Russia and the United States and, and China, China, which would be a hell of a challenge, yes. I might say. <laughs> um, and and there, there, is, there is a, you know, there's a current political reality, military reality, economic reality, that the biggest emitters also have a huge amount of power, massive amount of power. And, you know, uh, per capita Russia and per, per unit of GDP Russia is the emitter of the global emitter of the first class. Um, so I think it's unrealistic to expect some sort of magic forced solution coming out of the UN. Um, as I said before, we've had the national, the international agreement. It is now going to be down to really hard domestic politics in every country of the world 